It's kind of good fortune that the diocese celebrates this fortnight of freedom on the feast day of the apostles Peter and Paul. For Peter and Paul will allow us to recast the basic questions of what it means to have religious freedom. Take it away from kind of a modern notion that freedom resides in kind of a rational system of justice that is free of different kinds of ideologies and that somehow or other is pure in itself and if implemented correctly will certainly solve the social problems of our society. But you see, in reality and in truth, that is not the case. That the justice system conforms to the culture of every age and of every place. And that in doing so, it infuses into that culture a value system, a way of looking at things. And in so doing, it becomes, in a sense, a form of religion. With Peter and Paul, their crime was not to conform to the civil religion of Rome. What happened to them then was that they were executed. And 1,800 years later, the English historian Edward Gibbons writes that the Christians were the fall, were the cause of the fall of Rome because they destroyed the solidarity of the Roman culture by introducing a new God. And in so doing, Rome was unsustainable without its worship of the emperor and its worship of its pantheon. People were outraged when he wrote that. But if we stay and we look at it, we see that somehow or other there seems not to be room in the history of our people, of all people, for two absolute religions. In this we hear Peter say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. If Jesus is the Son of God, then he is also the author of created human nature. He is also divine and infinite and omniscient. He is the Lord of all, the Lord of the universe, the source through whom the Trinity creates. He is God. Humanity struggles with that. How dare there be a God that is not ourselves? How dare there be a God who does not come forth from the human imagination, from human creativity, from human reason, from human subjective needs. And the very fact that Jesus is God therefore places him over and against the forces of history. We see it over and over again. Peter and Paul died for adhering to the one true God. Well, I saw in the Cathedral Bulletin today the stories of the witnesses to freedom, the story of Kateri Tekakwitha, the story of Edith Stein, the story of Maximilian Kolbe, the story of the Carmelites of Compeg. Saw all of those, and what did they die for? They would not conform to the religion of the state. They would not conform to the human construct, which is called religion. And in our society today, we saw the drama played out in the Health and Human Services mandate, where the values of a secular civic religion was somehow or other challenged by faith in Jesus Christ by belief that he is God. To believe that he is God insults the creators 
of secular religion. It insults the creators of civic religion. And it says to them, you are not gods. You are not omniscient. You are not omnipotent. And you are not infinite. Each of those is a personal insult to those who are the creators of secular religion. It isn't so much that somehow or other there's differences in our society. That isn't the issue. The issue is that we will not serve another god. We will not bow down before a crazed secular ideology who knows the most important thing that it can do is to re-identify, recreate human nature, liberate it from a creator God, and make it a self-creating process. That's the religion that has become pervasive in our culture, in all Western culture. It is why, somehow or other, taking that line from John Locke, that the human person is the consequence of its consciousness. Do we hear that today, some hundreds of years later? Well, I think this, or I think that, or I, my consciousness is thus and so. We have taken the Enlightenment fallacy and we have built it into a cultural, civic religion. And its roots stem deep into intolerance and hatred and violence. For if you disagree with me, who have created myself through my consciousness, then you have denied my existence. I am who I think I am. I owe nothing to anything outside of me. When we look through those stories in the Cathedral Bulletin, which is beautifully done, when we look into the recent activities of the administration of our nation, of even the Supreme Court, the very fact that in a most innocuous way The little sisters of the poor were seen as a threat to the dominant religion of the government. What harm would it do to say, you're a small group of women, you're doing good things for the poor and the elderly, we will leave you alone. No. They were a challenge to the orthodoxy of secularism and therefore were treated as enemies of the state. Fortunately, there was kind of some loopholes, but those will not always be there. So in the consequence of this confrontation in modernity that has gone on for centuries and centuries in the great struggle between the belief in Jesus Christ the Son of the Living God, and the mythological creations of humanity, the Church has always had to suffer. Many have compromised. Many have decided it's easier to go along and get along. In the early Church, the traditores, the ones who handed over the sacred books, the ones who pretended to offer sacrifice to the gods, and so forth. And great debate broke out. St. Cyprian and Cornelius said, may they be forgiven even for having betrayed the living God and caused the death of their fellow believers. In every age, that struggle goes on. And in every age, it has dire consequences. And there are those who will say, Is it worth it, really? After all, certainly I believe in an afterlife. Certainly I believe in God. But a merciful, forgiving God, one who won't care if I betray him 
and my fellow believers, because after all, it seems like a more prudent thing to do. Peter and Paul were not prudent in that sense. Edith Stein was not prudent in that sense. Maximilian Kolbe was not prudent in that sense. The Carmelites of Compenge were not prudent in that sense. But in living for their faith and dying for their faith, they rooted more deeply the hope of humanity deep into the soils of their native lands. They somehow or other brought about the f- a view of vision of the absurdity of what was going on around them. The Carmelites, as they went to their death during the French Revolution, building the statues of reason inside Notre Dame Cathedral and developing a liturgy to honor reason, where did it end? They all end eventually in the trash heaps of history. For God and God alone is enough for humanity. And God and God alone is the truth. And God and God alone is our hope and our salvation. This evening, as we celebrate the presence of the Christ, the Son of the living God, honor those who understood what that meant and were not afraid of the constructs of the human mind and imagination, but who clung to the truth of the living God as we honor them. Let us pray that in our society, in our time, and in our place, as gradually, 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 the mythology of secularism absorbs the institutions of our culture, let us pray that we as Christians witness to the living God, not for the salvation only of our own souls, but for the salvation of all those who come to know Jesus Christ through the witness of those who are faithful to him. Finally, a great story about St. Fidelis of Sigmaringen, for instance, a Capuchin of the 16th century, that in he refused not to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was killed by a group of Zwinglian ministers, some of whom, in seeing him die, converted to Christ and became messengers of his truth, his hope, and his word. We may not certainly be called to the same kind of end that these great people were, but the idea is Do we want religious freedom? Then believe and trust and hope and witness to the living God. For the only freedom that humanity ever truly knows is the freedom of the soul. And that is what we seek. That is what we pray for. And that is what we live for. And perhaps even die for.